You look at the crystal and silicon approaches over time. You look at thin film approaches over time. And what you end up seeing is a much tighter distribution of data. If we do the same analysis now, where we normalize crystal and silicon at 100%, and we put in the other technologies, cadmium tellurides, 60% cost per watt advantage at the module level, declines to about 10 to 15%. It's a leader in the industry, as is, I believe, high efficiency silicon, particularly on low cost single axis trackers. Not winners. This is not clear cut winners, but they certainly are leaders in the industry. You take this analysis one step further, as is necessary to a levelized cost of electricity. You look at the grid again. And you look at a myriad of inputs that need to be addressed. Calculating power output can be done, and there is empirical data out there to help ratify it. So this is the least, well, I won't say the least, but it is a less difficult analysis to do at the levelized cost of electricity level. And it provides you with essentially the same analysis where you have leaders in high efficiency silicon and cadmium telluride, but no clear cut winners at the levelized cost of electricity level. What it tells you is you don't have a technology that will vanquish all the others, but you do have technologies that will play better in certain markets than other quite clearly. And we're already seeing some indication of that. That in a nutshell is a competitive positioning for the overall industry for solar PV. When we look at that, and you start to think about business models and end markets. How does all of this stuff get extrapolated to what companies are doing and ought to do in the face of what may be a rather turbulent time over the next few years and then explosive growth down the road? You look at this value chain again. If you're a module manufacturer and you are a low cost module manufacturer, that can be enough today. Why? Because if you are priced below market and we get precipitous falls in module prices, you will not be affected and your margins will probably remain intact. These are the leading thin film manufacturers. Effectively, what they have is the luxury of time. Now, it doesn't end with that. Why? If you're a high cost module manufacturer, which is essentially all crystal and silicon, how do you hedge against dropping prices, significantly dropping prices? There are two ways, one in particular that I think is most important. You integrate downstream and you sell systems and you sell energy. The other thing you can do is integrate upstream and make your own silicon. It's a difficult thing to do, but it will drop your cost basis rather substantially. <laughs> Selling energy, however, I think is the holy grail of this industry in a distributed model on a commercial scale. Not utility scale, at least not yet proven. It may prove out to work that way. But I think 10 kilowatts to 50 megawatts right now is what seems to be the sweet spot for the industry and distributed generation over time. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. The issue with selling energy today is the return on projects. Right now, it is not terribly attractive in many markets. Down the road, it will become very attractive in many markets. Whereas today, making and selling modules may be very attractive in many markets. Down the road, that will probably also change. So when you think about business models over the long term, this is the next translation slide, how Wall Street likes to think. You look at core business margin structure and an ROI profile, return on investment profile. What is a core business margin? What I mean by that are most of the companies out there that are in module manufacturing, for example. And then you look at energy business margin structure and an ROI profile. That is going downstream and selling energy, holding the asset or partially holding the asset down the road. Over the course of time, if we get a shakeout in this industry, my bet is that what happens, these core business margins and ROI profiles will decline over time. Selling energy, margin profiles and ROIs will improve over time. It's very simple to see why when you look at the superimposed levelized cost of electricity charts for the different technologies and for the grid. And when you go out into the future and you look at convergence, what happens? Even when you go back into a significant undersupply situation, the core business will stabilize, but at lower margins than what you had previously. However, as the spread widens between levelized cost of electricity and grid cost of electricity in a positive format for solar PV, what you effectively have is selling energy based upon the spread. If you believe that spread widens over time, the ROI of every project you layer in ought to be better. If it's better, it's more profitable. 
Where are the long-term profits in this industry most pronounced? I would bet they're in selling energy. Now that may be 5, 10, 15 years away, and Wall Street rarely thinks that way. But that is where companies want to move. When you look at some of the more strategic-minded companies in this industry, what have they done? They've vertically integrated. But rather than vertically integrating from making modules up to making wafers and ingots, they vertically integrate so that they can set up to sell energy. They may not sell energy today, but they acquire the ability to do so when the time is right in specific markets. Now, all that said, I've already kind of commented on this, the most profitable places in the value chains are selling energy over the long term and I'll say selling silicon. It's the last thing I wanted to touch upon here. Silicon is interesting in my opinion for the simple reason that I don't think you see a collapse in silicon pricing. I think you see contract pricing remain intact and I think spot pricing will come down to approach contract. I think the dynamic exists when you look at the longer term where you have an undersupply situation that could be radical. You end up with contracts remaining intact. If that's the case, you may see a decline in margin structure that's modest for silicon manufacturers that are mature, but it will not collapse. They will be strong. Now, I wanted to put one last slide here, and a lot of this is because of Julie's conversation a little bit earlier today and her presentation on utility scale because it's critically important. When you start to divide up the market into different segments, residential, what I'll call commercial, industrial, and then utility scale, power plant. Residential will largely be served by crystal and silicon. Why? Power density. It simply makes more sense at this point. There are some other issues associated with thin films that we won't go into here, but crystal and silicon, in my opinion, will dominate that segment over time. Commercial will be a combination of crystal and silicon and thin films. Same with industrial. What's very interesting about utility scale is that you've seen solar thermal as a competitive threat to solar PV. Maybe it's complementary over time. It may well be. But in the US, where we've actually seen some of these RFQs bid on in one, there are two technologies that seem to stand out. The only two technologies in production, at least that I can recall, that have one RFQ bids are high efficiency silicon on trackers and cadmium telluride on glass. Those are the two most competitive technologies, which is consistent with the analysis on levelized cost of electricity, and it allows companies to bid to win business. If modules become commodities in a nasty way over time, why do you still want to make them? Very simple reason. If you have a technology advantage that allows you to get the lowest levelized cost of electricity, the business you win is the energy business. So it's complementary to your business. If you don't have that, you think twice about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Thank you.